Hello and welcome to this broadcast by Brexit Watch. I'm your host, Jonathan Saxby. Today we are delighted to welcome back Britain's leading pollster, Professor Sir John Curtis. Sir John, welcome back to Brexit Watch. It's nice to be back, Jonathan. John, since we last spoke, which was in late spring, it feels like so much has happened, but it also feels a little bit like not a huge amount has changed. It's a kind of strange uh, in-between situation at the moment. Since we last spoke, John, how have the polls shifted or remained the same in terms of assessment of the government's handling of the crisis? Yeah, I think you're right that not a great deal has changed so far as uh, handling of the, by the government of the coronavirus. The truth is that it was May that was the month in which things changed. Uh, during that month, the combination of the Prime Minister's broadcast in the middle of that month when he first announced the easing of the lockdown measures and seemed to cause quite a lot of confusion, followed, of course, by the very substantial row over Dominic Cummings, uh, and, uh, what we now refer to as his uh, day trip to uh, Barnard Castle. Uh, those two events seem between them to have done the government's evaluations a lot of damage. Since then, it's pretty much flatlined. I mean, uh, Opinion, uh, the company that has been uh, probably been tracking this most regularly, and they basically find 31% of people prove that the government's handling their most recent poll, 47% don't. And it's been pretty much there or thereabouts for quite a while. Another poll, for example, by Savanta, paints, uh, paints a similar picture. And again, equally, evaluations of how well Boris Johnson in particular has handled coronavirus, again, tends to be in at least mildly negative territory. But yes, it's not clear that anything that's happened since May has really moved the dial in one direction or another. So as it were, I guess one has to say that on the one hand, it's not clear that the easing of the lockdown um, and therefore the greater freedom that people have had to run their own lives has particularly give, been uh, credited to the government. Indeed, actually, um, the polling still tends to suggest that there are more people who think the government is unlocking too quickly uh, than feel that they're, they're unlocking too slowly. Yeah, there are a fair number of things are getting about right, and you know, conservative voters are uh, m more generous on that count. But certainly still, as it were, uh, the uneasing the lockdown is not something on, which is getting the government a great deal of credit. Equally, however, more recently, the fact that the prevalence of the uh, disease has slowly been creeping back up from its low point in what June or so, um, that equally so far at least doesn't seem to have caused the public to doubt the government's handling of the coronavirus any more uh, than it has done already. So to that extent, at least, yes, it's uh, a relatively steady ship in an electorate which is clearly still concerned about coronavirus uh, but evidently is uh, no more unhappy at least about the government's handling than it was about three months ago. John is there any um, clean split between right of centre voters and left of centre voters on the issue of whether the government is unlocking too quickly or too slowly? Well, there's a degree um, in that undoubtedly conservative voters are somewhat keener on the idea of unlocking more quickly than are others. But frankly, even if you take um, uh, Opinion's most recent survey, 32% of Tory supporters felt it was too fast, only 18% too slow. So yes, the, the truth is that the modal conservative voter feels it's about right. But insofar as there is criticism, even amongst conservative voters, it's more likely to be that it's too fast than it's too slow. But yeah, sure, those uh, who are supporting opposition parties are inevitably much more likely critical. I mean, that's just true across the board. Uh, but I think certainly the fact that, um, you know, I mean, even amongst um, those who voted conservative last December, only just over a half say they're satisfied with the way in which the government is handling coronavirus. And you know, it is fairly clear that, yes, it's a minority, but there is a minority of those who voted for the government in December who are at least a tad uneasy about how things have been handled. And in some cases, not dramatically, but in some cases, this does seem to have cost the government electoral support. It is now running, if you take the five polling companies that are polling, 
uh, more or less every month on a regular basis. Um, you know, in August, they were putting the government at 42%, and that's down three points from what it had in the election. It's certainly well down, of course, what it was um, earlier this year before uh, uh, the uh, events of May and before Sir Keir Starmer became Labour leader. Uh, still could be regarded as pretty healthy for a government to be still uh, ahead in the polls at, at this stage. But, you know, if you actually look at the detail of the polls, and it doesn't here, frankly, views about Brexit don't seem to matter very much. There's just evidence of both amongst Leave voters and amongst Remain voters of the Tory tally just being shaved off a little. And that yes, it looks as though that's more likely to have happened amongst those who are critical of the government's handling. So I don't think the government can, be, can afford to be complacent about this. But certainly, I think what is true is that the government's popularity more broadly has held up more the better than you might have anticipated given the relatively negative evaluations of its handling of the coronavirus and i think that's probably an indication at the end of the day that you know voters faith in the conservative party extends beyond its competence in handling this particular public health crisis it is a party that of course that above all uh, won its election victory in December by getting the support of nearly three quarters of those who voted Leave. That division between Leave and Remain voters is still there. Yes, maybe at the moment the average proportion of uh, Leave support for the party is down to about two thirds, more than three quarters, but it's still very healthy. And I think for so long as at least that this is a government is, that is seemingly on course to deliver Brexit, albeit of course there are. Uh, arguments about how well those talks are going but so long as that seems to be the case then uh, and given that this is a government that was elected to deliver Brexit and is very reliant on the support of Brexit supporting voters but so long as I think as that project is uh, is on board uh, then the government is going to retain much of its support whatever uh, worries or doubts voters may have about handling the coronavirus for the time being at least. John, we'll come on to Brexit and the polling um, later on in the conversation, but you mentioned the um, polling between the two major parties. I saw some polling recently which actually seemed to suggest that two parties were level pegging, both in terms of the actual raw poll numbers, but also in terms of competence. How much do you think this is about personality and the, the perceived competence of Keir Starmer on the one hand versus Boris Johnson on the other? Well, the, the first thing to remember about the headlining and reporting of opinion polls is that it is always the exceptional poll that gets most publicity. So you are correct. We have now had, for the first time uh, since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, a poll, and I will repeat, a poll that has Conservative and Labour neck and neck. And that's generated a lot of interest. It actually comes from a company opinion that has tended to report relatively low leads for the Conservatives quite a while, typically around the order of two or three points, not least because according to opinion at least, it looks as though the Labour Party is beginning to corral the support of Remain voters behind it. Uh, and um, you know, uh, opinion are saying now around three-fifths of Remain voters uh, would vote Labour. And then there's almost a parallel, uh, a, a symmetrical position now uh, amongst uh, Remain voters supporting Labour and um, Leave voters supporting the Conservatives. But other polls don't pick up quite the same extent. And so the truth is you should look at the polls across the piece. And if we look, as I said, at the five polling companies that are polling regularly, most recent poll towards the back end of August, it's Conservative 42, Labour 37, a lead of five points. Mm. If you do the same calculation for the same polling companies at the end of July, it was a six point lead. So yes, the lead has narrowed a little bit. And what is worth bearing in mind, particularly certainly once you take into account the position in Scotland, that five point lead could well be insufficient to produce another Conservative majority. And we do have to bear in mind that it is probably extremely unlikely if we do get another Hyde Parliament after the next election that anybody uh, amongst the opposition parties will be willing uh, 
to allow the Conservatives to remain in office, at least other than, other than the DUP. So the Conservatives do have to keep on winning. Otherwise, I think, frankly, they're going to be out on their ear. And to that, so that extent, at least, yes, there is some reason for Conservative MPs to start to worry. The party is not 11 points ahead, as it was, was last December. But it is still ahead. I mean, on competence that you were asking me, um, yeah, certainly um, one interesting thing, I mean, it, the truth is that the Conservative Party is still often ahead of the Conservative of the Labour Party on some of the crucial uh, measures. I mean, for example, um, uh, ask people which party can best handle the economy. Jail partners still found recently uh, the Conservatives ahead, um, you know, at Starmer at 27 and the Labour Party at Johnson 39. That said, if you look, compared the position with when the same company asked the same question back last January, then the lead was much greater. Um, and that is true on other, it's even true on Brexit, by the way, that perceptions of the competence of the Conservative Party have gone down. That's clear from JL Partners. They're not, I mean, they're still ahead of Labour, but they're not as far ahead of Labour. Um, it's also clear that some lead voters, I don't believe, but it's not somewhat less likely to think that the government is handling uh, Brexit well done was the case back in January when Brexit was was delivered. So broadly speaking, yes, the perceptions of the competence of the government have gone down pretty much across the board, but that still leaves it ahead on what are arguably still the two most crucial issues, visit, visit Brexit and the economy. So um, I think, and that's where perhaps coronavirus again is Made some given. I mean, I think you know more broadly, insofar as it's an issue of competence. You know, for some voters, it probably had an impact. It's something for the Conservative Party to worry about, but it's not as yet looking anything like a terminal situation. And you know, we are now well after the last general election, but the, the government's still ahead in the polls. And you know, there aren't that many governments who manage to stay in the polls, stay ahead in the polls for very long once they're in office. John, you mentioned Scotland. I believe you're actually based in Scotland. And um, I believe that Nicola Sturgeon has now touted the idea of a, of a second referendum. Uh, possibly, I, this is this would be interesting to discuss with you, maybe capitalising on what she perceives as some um, degree of antagonism towards the government in Westminster. What's your assessment of the likelihood of a second independence referendum, but more crucially, what does the data show north of the border up in Scotland about support or opposition to independence compared to the last referendum? Well, let's take a second <laughs> of your question first. Um, if you take the average of the last half dozen opinion polls on the subject, uh, which basically, you know, June through to August, yes, 54, no, 46. So yes, are now consistently ahead. And those figures now come from three different polling companies. They've all spotted the same thing. Um, and that compares with the outcome uh, at the last uh, referendum back in 2014 of yes, 45, no, 55. This is the first time in Scottish polling history that support for independence has consistently outpaced support for the union over a fairly extended period of time across a number of polls. And to that extent, we are in uncharted territory. There are two things that lie beneath this, one of which I have to say to you straight away is uncomfortable for those who are in favour of Brexit. The Scotland, of course, voted to, re voted to remain. Now, initially, despite the expectation movement, actually, the, that decision did not change the aggregate numbers so far as support for independence concerned, i.e. throughout the rest of 2016, 2017, 2018, on average, the polls were still saying, roughly speaking, yes, 45, no, 55, um, i.e. we were still uh, basically where we were beforehand. However, underneath that, what was going on? was a reshaping of the character of support for independence. One of the ironies of the 2014 independence referendum is that we spend a lot of time between, on both sides of the argument, arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland could or could not uh, be a, remain a continuing member of the European Union because the 
uh, at that stage, the no side was saying, look, if you want to stay inside the European Union, it's better to revoke to stay inside. Uh, they better to vote no, and the SNP said no, we will be able to carry on inside the European Union. Well, in the end, both sides were completely wasting their time because actually people's views on Europe were unrelated to whether they voted yes or no. And indeed, when you come to the 2016 referendums, although the SNP's vision of independence has, for the last 20, 30 years or so, has been on independence within the European Union, actually around a third of those people who voted yes in 2014 voted no in 2016. But what, what, what did happen in the wake of the, Brexit, of the Brexit referendum was this resorting. Some people who voted no and remain switch to yes. There were some people who were sufficiently upset about the decision about Brexit to go in that direction, but they were counterbalanced by an equal number of people who said yes and leave, therefore leaving the net figures unchanged, but that structure had changed. There was now a relationship between your views about the European Union and whether or not you thought Scotland should be independent. And then what we began to see last year, and this rise in support for independence is now actually quite an old story. But polls last year began consistently to identify a rise in support for independence. And if you take all the polls conducted in 2019, including through to the general election, it was yes, 49, no, 51. So we were basically getting to the 50-50 point. Indeed, by the time we got to Brexit day, we were at 50-50. All of this increase in support for independence occurred amongst those who had voted Remain. And the message I have to give you, Jonathan, and it is an uncomfortable one for many people on the Brexit side of the argument. You might like it to be true that Scotland is an indivisible part of the United Kingdom um, and that it's perfectly democratic for Scotland to be leaving the European Union along with the rest of the UK. Uh, it's an it's a, it's a integral part of the United Kingdom. However, the political reality you need to understand is that the pursuit of Brexit has undermined support for the union north of the border. And that's just something you have to take on board in your political calculations and, and working out where you go for next and how indeed, how you sell the argument in favor of Brexit, okay? Now, beyond that, the rise of support to 54% doesn't look as though it's due with Brexit. This takes us back to coronavirus because the rise in support since January, February of this year has occurred amongst both Remain voters and amongst Leave voters. So it's not obviously with Brexit. What it looks as though it's to do with is coronavirus, because we've been talking earlier about how you know, people are on balance, they're negative about the government's evaluation of uh, coronavirus. This is not true of the Scottish government and Nicola Sturgeon. They are getting rave ratings. Nicola Sturgeon's personal rating now for how, how she's doing as First Minister is back to the very, very high levels that they were in the immediate wake when she first became First Minister shortly after the 2014-15 referendum and the SNP was on course to get 50% of the vote in Scotland. Um, and crucially, what you need to understand is that even amongst Leave voters and even amongst no voters, Nicola Sturgeon's rating on coronavirus is much better than that of Boris Johnson's Conservative. So this is not a case of nationalist voters and yes, and SNP voters saying, of course, and Nicola Sturgeon walks on water and Boris, Boris Johnson is the devil incarnate. It's not simply that partisan reaction. Actually, voters different, uh, different even those who are on the unionist and the pro-Brexit side of the argument hold that view. Actually, so do voters in England. Nicola Sturgeon's rating in England is also relatively positive. And crucially then also what you discover is that when you people get asked about whether or not coronavirus would have been handled better if Scotland were an independent country, well, yes, unsurprisingly, most yes voters say yes, but crucially, only 4% say no. 20% of those people who voted no, it's a minority, but it's 20% of people who voted no in 2014 say, you know what, actually, I think it would have handled coronavirus better. And you have to remember that 
One of the SNP's central arguments has long been that an independent Scotland would govern itself more effectively. And coronavirus, which is the, by far and away, the most important public policy issue that has faced the devolved government in Scotland since uh, 1999, um, is one uh, where, at the moment at least, that argument is working to the advantage of, of the SI. Now, my other thing to say, and then I'll stop, which is, that, of course, what is true is that all of this has happened in a vacuum, i.e. we've not been debating independence and the merits of otherwise there are. And it may well be that all of this will change once we start to have a debate. The debate's now begun to start because those on the union side of the argument are beginning to get their act together and beginning to marshal their arguments. But one of the things also to bear in mind is that the arguments on both sides have moved on very considerably. Uh, an awful lot has changed since 2014 and some of the arguments that both sides deployed in 2014 would no longer work. So both sides have quite a lot of job, quite an important job to do to rework out what the arguments are, and then we don't know how the public will react. John, I want to um, don't, don't want to dwell on Scotland too much, but just want to pick up on one one issue there. Yeah. If the Tories weren't in power, if Keir Starmer was was uh, prime minister, how do you think that would shift the sands in Scotland and the perception of Nicola Sturgeon and the perception of the worthiness of independence? Well. Um, it's certainly true, actually, you know, this is going one of the difficulties facing the Prime Minister. What is certainly true is that at the moment, the opportunity that the SNP has to gain an overall majority, which is what the polls suggest will happen in next year's devolved election, actually arises not because the Conservative Party is particularly unpopular by historical standards in Scotland, it's still running at around 20%. It's currently on course to do roughly as well as it did in 2016, not as well as in 2017 in the Westminster election, but it, you know, it got 21% in 2016. The real problem is the weakness of the Labour Party in Northern Ireland, which is now down at 14, 15%. Um, and one of the strategic paradoxes of the situation is almost undoubtedly, if the SNP are going to be denied an overall majority, actually there needs to be a revival of the Labour Party north of the border. Uh, Boris Johnson will never admit that that's the case but almost undoubtedly that is true. If, this, if, the, if, the, if the government next year is going to avoid the situation of facing an SNP majority on the back of a, of a manifesto promise that um, uh, there should be another referendum, then he needs the Labour Party to revive. Now as we speak there looks as though there may be an attempt to unseat Richard Leonard is leader of the Scottish Labour Party in much the same way as Jackson Carlaw was unseated as leader of the Scottish Conservatives just a few weeks ago. And again, that's another example of how those on the union side are getting work. So that's the, in the short run, that, that's the crucial thing. More broadly, of course, well, you know, the, the truth is, uh, the broader answer to your question is if indeed the Conservatives had not won the last election and we'd had a minority Labour administration, um, then, um, well, Pro and then we hadn't had coronavirus since I thought probably at the moment we'd be talking about there being a Scottish independence referendum maybe perhaps not until after next May this discussion we wanted it now but the truth is at the end of the day that um well so, I mean here again stories moved on under John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn the Labour Party was saying well we don't want independence but we accept that maybe there needs to be a referendum Keir Starmer has decidedly come out against a referendum Difficulty with that stance is that somewhere between the third and 40% of Labour's vote in 2019 is in favour of independence. So it's not obviously a stance that's going to help the Labour Party to revive more of the board. But yes, so I mean, I'm, I'm not, sh I mean, you know, I mean, so the, I, the, the other broader answer to, of course, is well, if we had a Labour government at the moment, we might have been having another EU referendum. That would have certainly postponed the Scottish independence referendum for the time being, and then much would depend on the outcome. Sure, it, it follows from what I said earlier, but again, it's uncomfortable for those who are in favour of Brexit, that if we had had another referendum, and if we had voted to remain, which, shall we say, was at least 50% likely, given what the polls were saying, then actually maybe um, Scot the Scottish issue would have died because, Scotland, because um, uh, uh, Brexit would have been reversed. I said I wanted to move off Scotland, but just one more thought comes into my head, John, based on what you've been saying. 
what would Brexiteers and uh, Conservatives and Unionists, what you said they were sort of Unionists were starting to get their act together, what kind of message would they have to start to articulate to sort of bring the bring support back um, for the union and against independence? What what are they what are, what's the trick they're missing right now? Yeah, well, the lesson of the 2014 election is that at the end of the sorry, 2014 referendum is that the crucial issue at the end of the day uh, tends to be people's uh, evaluations of the economic consequences of independence. And that is the argument that in the end the yes side were not able to win. But it is the argument that perhaps now has become easier for the yes side to win because economic evaluations of the consequences of Brexit are highly negative north of the border. Um, and insofar as the evaluation that people are now being asked to choose is between Scotland being um, uh, inside the, the single market versus being inside the, the single market of the United Kingdom, uh, as opposed to uh, being able to be independent and still being a member of both, um, and they're being faced with that tougher choice. Arguably, making the economic case has not got any easier. That said, I mean, I, so, so, so one, one thing is certainly to win the economic argument, and that's certainly what the union side are, are focusing on. The difficulty, however, is this, is, uh, and this was, this was a problem for the union side in 2014, um, much of the unionist argument tends to be, if you leave the United Kingdom, the world will collapse to, uh, uh, tomorrow. Project Fear. Now, those of you on the on the on the Brexit side of the argument will be aware of Project Fear. It was used in the EU referendum. Now, some of us will the view it wasn't terribly effective in the 2014 referendum because, in the end, support for independence was much higher, and in the end, it wasn't sufficient in the uh, EU referendum. And I think the point is, therefore, that in the end, the Union side need to not simply say to people that uh, uh, Bre that um, uh, leaving the UK will be a disaster, but actually what would Scotland get as a result of being inside the, EU, uh, the, the United Kingdom? And here the problem is, is that unionism is divided between a conservative vision and a Labour vision, whereas the nationalist side is united behind an SNP vision. And that's why the, there's the emphasis on the negative message, because there isn't any give on the positive message. The other, the other crucial argument, of course, and the, you know, this, this is one of those things where the facts have changed, and which raises a whole new argument. Uh, which those of you, are, those who are on the Brexit side of the argument, will certainly, I think, will want to key into, is of course that if indeed the argument is that an independent Scotland should rejoin the European Union, is what do we do about the border between Gretna and Berwick? Uh, because that will become a single market border, um, and if we've learned anything about um, single market borders on relatively small islands in the last three, three or four years, is that it becomes a very difficult issue if you're going to try to keep that border open while maintaining the integrity of the single market. Uh, and that's not really a, a, an argument that uh, the SNP have engaged in with yet. They're inclined to say, oh, that's the UK's fault because it's wandering off to, um, uh, out of the European Union. Oh, and you know, well, we'll have to have a similar, uh, uh, a similar um, solution to the one on the island of Ireland. Well, the problem with that, of course, is that what's effectively happened on the island of Ireland is that Northern Ireland is staying inside the single market in the customs union. Uh, I don't think Indian and Wales are going, to be, are going to stay inside the single market in the customs union under the current Conservative administration. John, that leads nicely on to Brexit, I think. Now, you've, you've briefly mentioned the polling on, on Brexit. Um, so my sort of, this question is really, it's, it's a bit of a long question in a way. Firstly, what is the polling looking like on Brexit as the, at the moment? particularly the polling on the negotiations, which let's face it, you know, there have been a lot of problems. On our side, the uh, Brexit side of the argument, there's a lot of support for David Frost, a lot of animosity towards Michel Barnier and the EU side, but more widely, what has the perception been? And particularly with regards maybe to zone in on Northern Ireland, on the, I can tell you that for a lot of people on our side of the debate, um, there's a lot of fear over the withdrawal agreement. There's a lot of concern about the Northern Irish Protocol. You just mentioned about Northern Ireland, this idea that somehow the Northern Ireland may well be stuck in the customs union going forward. 
I've interviewed Sammy Wilson. Uh, he, he has his concerns. I know others have their concerns. What is the opinion polling showing on Brexit, the negotiations, and zoning in, if possible, on Northern Ireland? Well, I, I hate to disappoint you, Jonathan, but I mean, one of the consequences of the coronavirus pandemic is that it really has knocked Brexit out of the polling spectrum. And the, the truth is that the um, debate and argument about the negotiations and the, the issues in those negotiations, it's a, it's a fierce argument that's going on at elite level um, between people like yourselves and people like Best for Britain. Um, um, and between the UK government and the EU government and the devolved administrations, but it's going on at that level and it's not, it's getting a bit of publicity, but not a lot. And it's getting, the handling of negotiations themselves is getting very, very publicity. I, what I can tell you is two things. Uh, and we've got a bit of polling on attitudes towards the principle of Brexit, i.e. whether or not there's still a majority in favour. Um, one of the, th the things that seemed, there were about two things were in evidence in the immediate wake of the delivery of Brexit Day. One is that when polls were either still asking people whether they would vote remain or leave, um, or YouGov were asking in hindsight, do you think Brexit was right or wrong? There was some evidence that the lead that the polls had consistently showing that there was now a majority in favour of Remain. That's been the position of the polls for a long time. So it's 53-47, even by uh, still a Brexit day in favour of Remain. But that lead was narrowing. You know, maybe it was down 52-48, 51-49. In other words, there was a bit of evidence, first of all, that maybe some Remain voters were now beginning to accept that it had happened and it was time to move on. The second thing that was certainly true is that when polls started to ask people, not whether you vote Remain or leave, but would you vote to stay out or rejoin, that there was a fairly clear majority around 54, 46, saying that, that we should stay out. So changing the question made a difference and that's not unimportant. So in other words, there may well be a body amongst Remain voters who may still regret Brexit, but who, again, I don't frankly want to go through that argument again. And, you know, if we've got out, I don't think it's worth trying to rejoin. So that, that works uh, 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 to your side. However, more recent, and it's thin, I have to say straight away, straight away that it is thin, um, except for you, Gov, who have started asking the in hindsight question more regularly. Um, so what that's beginning to show is basically remain 52, leave 48, it's not shifted very much. Um, and you, Gov's in hindsight question, which had shown this narrowing, or, you know, almost as many people saying it was right, saying it's wrong. It's now back to around five, six point lead for wrong over right. And the figures now amongst both Remain and Leave voters look virtually identical to what they were um, back at the back end of last year. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, the truth is very few Remain voters have changed their minds. Very few Leave voters have changed their minds. The principal reason why we tend to get uh, more people saying in high, uh, that Brexit was wrong rather than right, or if they say about Remain, Bob Lee, are the views expressed by those who didn't vote in 2016. Though occasionally the Leave vote looks a little bit uh, uh, flakier. Um, but um, basically, you know, I think the answer is we are still as divided on this subject as we were. And I know no pollster is going to say to you when the polls say it's 52 48, they're going to tell you it's obvious what the outcome of another referendum would be. But it's pretty clear we are still somewhere close to 50 50, much as we have been for the last four years. And this remains a deeply divisive issue. Um, one of the things that we don't know anything at all about are people's, as I said, people's views about the negotiations. Um, all we do have is that we do have some polling about how well people think that the government is handling uh, 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 Brexit. That's coming from primarily from YouGov. And now that, that's a subject where um, evaluations of the handling of Brexit you know, improved dramatically under Boris Johnson and particularly improved dramatically um, uh, when it became clear that Brexit was going to be delivered. And of course, particularly amongst Leave voters. 
However, you know, that, the, the numbers on that have now begun to become more and more negative again uh, for the government. And leave, I mean, leave voters for the most part are still on balance, um, positive about the government's handling of, of, of Brexit and arguably, you know, that at the end of the day is the crucial constituency for the Conservative government. It's a government elected by Leave voters that is effectively therefore accountable to Leave voters and frankly what the main voters think is largely irrelevant to the party. Um, uh, but, you know, amongst Leave voters all I can say to you is there's just some sign that they're not quite as happy now, although they're still relatively happy, as they were back at the beginning of this year. But whether or not that's anything to do with the progress of the negotiations, whether it's anything to do with the fact that some Leave voters uh, may be concerned about the prospect of there not being a deal, frankly, nobody knows because nobody's been asking. Um, and to that extent, therefore, we, we, we don't know. And, and I think, you know, the truth is probably that, um, you know, the fact's only going to hit the political fat uh, fire, fire on this um, when we get to late October and mm. we either discover that there is at least some kind of deal, may, albeit maybe perhaps a pretty thin deal that in practice means more flat negotiation goes on thereafter, or whether we're going out without a deal. I mean, that's point one where it will fit. Hit the other point at which it will hit and will be crucial will be January, February. Okay? If the supermarket sh sh shelves are bare, if the medicine doesn't get into the country, if the pictures are of um, the motorways of Kent being blocked, of fruit rotting on lorries in Calais, that's the point at which the pictures will potentially tell a thousand words that could prove to be uncomfortable for the government. On the other hand, if none of this happens, if indeed we uh, discover that, you know, actually we do adapt, not least of course, because the UK at the moment is not really uh, very strongly, um, uh, it's not going to attempt to enforce uh, customs for, for six months or so. Um, and actually, you know, it all doesn't prove to be so difficult after all. Um, and in the longer run, indeed, the vision of Brexit uh, makes us better off is delivered, then it'll be fine. But I think in other words, the consequences of Brexit only really begun, begin to become manifest from next year, um, and that um, is uh, uh, you know, a, a story yet to reveal. John, regarding um, opinion polling on Brexit, how is that shaping up at the moment in the shadow of the coronavirus situation? Um, what are the demographics on that? And particularly for a lot of people on our side, there's concern over the withdrawal agreement. Is there anything you can say about the polling and also specific to Northern Ireland? Well, I think the first thing I have to say, Jonathan, one of the consequences of the pandemic and also the feeling that left the European Union, what is there left to argue about, at least as compared with the position 12 months ago, is that there's been very, very little polling on the subject. Uh, the detail, and there's been very little media coverage, frankly, of the details of the negotiations, which are effectively going on in an elite level bubble um, between officials, between politicians, with organisations like yourselves and Best for Britain kind of cheering from the sidelines or criticising from the sidelines. And that's about it. Um, the, the arguments about Northern Ireland, at least on this side of the water, have just not been bothering the pollsters at all um, and you know uh, the, the, the truth is there's always been a slight feeling on this side of the water that um, people are not sure why the Northern Ireland tail should be allowed to wag the English dog and I think that's probably going to be the reason why at the end of the day Northern Ireland is not going to be crucial to the views of many voters. What we we don't even have a great deal of polling on the principle of Brexit still or indeed on how well the government is handling things, but we do have a little on that. So on the, and the interesting thing there is that if we um, look at the situation immediately after Brexit was delivered on the 31st of January, the, the, a crucial question at that point was, well, so is that the end of the argument? 
is it the case that Remain voters are going to uh, pick up their bags and carry, and, and carry on and accept that Brexit's happened um, and you know, that, was, that was the end of the argument. Um, and there were some signs of that movement in you know, March, April of this year. Um, two pieces of evidence. One was that when people were being asked still, the question that appeared on the 2016 ballot paper, remain or leave, we were, you know, we had one or two polls at 50-50, and it looked as though perhaps the leader of Remain over Leave, and there was a leader of Remain over Leave, and had been Remain, a leader of Remain over Leave uh, as late as Brexit Day, um, but that the, that narrow lead had narrowed further. Second piece of evidence, perhaps, was even more interesting, is that when pollsters, a few pollsters, not very much, but a little, one or two pollsters, started asking people not Remain versus Leave. But what would now be the question if we were to ever revisit this issue again of that, which is to rejoin or stay out, then it was clear that, re that staying out was the more popular option. Six, And that therefore, certainly, even if the main voters, for the most part, were still perhaps regretting Brexit, there were at least some of them who were willing indeed to uh, pick up their bags and move on. Um, and that, on that latter point, we've had one more poll more recently, indeed a polling organisation that switched from remain leave to um, uh, stay in get out, and it, it, got, it had 56% for remain in its last time it asked remain versus leave, it now got 54% for uh, staying out. So the change of wording certainly matters. Um, but on the other data, i.e. ask people remain or leave, or you, Gov, who have tended to ask this question in hindsight, do you think? Brexit's right or wrong, which they've been asking quite a lot again more recently for some reason. We are back to now remain 52, leave 48, not because many leave voters have changed their minds, as indeed have not made very many remain voters. What still is the case is that the principal reason why we keep on tending to get a small majority in favour of remain is that those who did not vote in 2016, many of simply some of whom are younger voters, tend to say remain. If there's any group that ever changed their mind since 2016, it was the people who didn't vote. They clearly became more pro-remain during the course of the last four years. Um, but also, um, I know they're, they're back to about 52-48. YouGov, with that in hindsight question, you know, were uh, getting a narrow lead. So they had five, six point leads for wrong over right. This had got down to around two or three. It's back to five points. Um, and to that extent, at least, um, we are now back where we were in that in hindsight question. Remain voters and leave voters, you know, 87% of remain voters say it's wrong, 83% of leave voters say it is right. These are virtually identical numbers to the position back in October, November, December last year. To that extent, at least, that evidence suggests that although maybe for a while there was some suggestion that the division was perhaps going to away, it now still seemed to be with us just as much, which I think therefore is an indication that when the subject does begin to get back into the public domain, and I think you know, that it's bound to happen at least to some degree towards the end of October when the negotiations are either going to produce something in the way of a future relationship agreement or not, um, that that's going to be a crucial point. And a second crucial point will be when uh, we are out of the single market uh, and the customs union at the beginning of next year and what the consequences of that do or do not prove to be. Are there difficulties at the border? Do we find interruptions to our food supply? Do we find interruptions to our medicine supply? Or actually, uh, does all this prove to be scare stories and business actually be able to cope with the filling in the forms? Um, and um, meanwhile, we get more trade agreements elsewhere and you know, Brexit proves to be uh, perfectly successful. Um, so I mean, at the point where evaluations begin to kick in. I think all one needs to be aware of this at the moment. Yes, it's true that one half of the public, those who voted leave, still seem to be hoping and believing that this is going to be a success. But the other half of the public that voted Remain is still basically going, I'm not terribly sure that this was a very good idea, and will probably pounce on any evidence of Brexit 
proving to be more difficult and less successful than those on the Brexit side of the argument believe is going to be the case. And to that extent, at least, therefore, you know, the, the, the argument may still be carrying on. But then, look, you know, I don't need to tell you that the 1975 referendum did not end the argument. And not long after the 1975 referendum, the Labour Party was campaigning to get out of the common market. And not long after that, Alan Sked founded UKIP, and the rest is history. And one suspects that this argument is still going to be with us and that those on the Remain side of the argument will probably carry on for the time being, probably sotto voce and probably not being cheered on by the Labour Party. But I suspect this argument is going to keep on, is going, it's going to remain with us. Um, because it is just something on which people on both sides of the argument do feel. John, penultimate question. You touched on the issue if there'll be any no, if the perception of, of no trade deal. What do you think would be the ramifications if there was a perception that it was a bad deal in terms of the withdrawal agreement, Northern Irish protocol? I'm thinking of Brexit supporting um, Boris Johnson voters. Or indeed, if there's any delay, I mean, obviously Downing Street are adamant there will be no delay, we passed the June deadline. But if there was to be some, a little bit of kicking the can down there, a little bit of pushing into next year, or indeed a strong perception that actually it, it, it wasn't the best deal, the withdrawal agreement wasn't the best deal, what do you think the impact would be for the Tories? Okay, I think it's, first of all, let's take the deadline first. I think that's clearly the hard promise that the government have made and which they have at least to be able to claim to have delivered. Now I'm using my words carefully there because of course one of the speculations is that what we might end up with is what is now called in the jargon a thin deal which perhaps is not that much more watertight than the political agreement that we've been trying to get the detail of, and that it will set up lots of committees to go away and come up with further detail. Um, though, you know, that's still going to be quite a lot of impact because you know, I think uh, the European Union does, but it is very strongly firmly belief on the integrity of the single market and the, 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 the customs uh, checks are, get, and, and, uh, are going to be there in place pretty much I think on, on, on January the 1st next year at least on the EU side not on the UK side um, but you know given that how, how should I put it given that Boris Johnson succeeded in persuading his party that a deal on Northern Ireland that looked rather similar to one that the European Union originally proposed to the UK government and was vehemently opposed by Theresa May at the time, um, albeit, you know, with a few, few softer edges. Um, given that he managed to succeed in persuading people of the merits of that, bec not because it did mean that there was at least a deal that perhaps as a result could eventually be got through the, through, through the House of Commons. Um, you know, maybe the Prime Minister's political skills will mean that even if it is a thin deal of the kind I've described, he will be able to say we have delivered and we are out of the single market and we're out of the customs union, blah, blah, blah. I know, and all the rest of it is detail. Nobody's interested. And, and he will look to the lack of interest, in the public lack of public interest in the negotiations since January as, as, as evidence for that. So I think that's what they have to, to, to deliver. Now, um, of course, um, you know, I think the argument, I mean, in a sense, the most difficult um, uh, thing for um, the, the government will be um, probably not initially public reaction. So, I mean, the, I mean the, the thing that above all Boris Johnson needs to do is to keep his party together. And of course, you know, there's been, been a bit of fraying in the edges of you know, all of that because of the coronavirus. Um, and, probably the thing that he would have to worry about is that if indeed if people are on the Brexit side of the argument look at the deal whatever comes up and you go this looks like a bad deal actually we've not got freedom on state aid actually we have given too much on fish actually somewhere at the back of this trail of, uh, of accountability the ECJ still do have a role um, 
etc., uh, etc. Et if some of these issues you know, uh, remain crucial, then um, and therefore you get a split, splintering within the Leave movement, then some Leave voters will take their cue from that, and it causes difficulty for the government. I mean, that said, how do I put it? It would be truly remarkable if a conservative administration were to decide that being able to prop up what once were called failing industries was such an important economic principle that it was willing to turn down a free trade with the European Union. That was quite a political sight. And perhaps it might prove somewhat more politically difficult to sell than perhaps many of those on this argument. Because of course, some people are saying it's an issue of sovereignty. Well, yeah, okay. But actually, at least until this Conservative administration, ever since 1979, no Conservative administration would have been regarding uh, having the freedom to be able to prop up what's once called failing industries as a point of political principle for the party. So that's, I think, you know, in other words, an equally fish, it's very small. Perhaps it's the principle. And, I, and so, I, so, so I think, so I think you know, in exactly the same way as, you know, in the end of the day, arguably the Leave movement mm -hmm. attached more uh, importance to Northern Ireland than most voters in England would. I think my advice would be do not assume that even Leave voters will necessarily regard some of the things that are apparently holding up the negotiations as points of uh, principle that are worth sacrificing. What you know, is meant to be the claim of uh, the principal argument of um, the, the Leave campaign, which was to open up a world in which the United Kingdom was engaged in free trade across the world. Now that was, I think, a vision that included the European Union. Uh, and, the, the, and yes, of course, crucially, the rest of the world as well. But I think it did include the European Union. Mm. I suppose it's all an issue of sovereignty. And of course, in the post-coronavirus world, uh, a, lot, a lot has changed. Um, John, final question. As we head into the autumn, the furlough scheme is going to be unwound. It's already started unwinding. The Eat Out to Help Out scheme has is, is, is ended, although some restaurants are keeping it going. It's a, Great concern. Um, I've written about this in the Telegraph with alongside our chairman Ben Habib. The concern about the furlough scheme unwinding without any mitigating strategy in place. We've spoken about potential autumn of discontent coming. Um, if if there is such a scenario, um, how do you think that is going to play out in terms of polling? And indeed, do you think such a scenario is likely in the coming months? Well, I mean, Jonathan, here you're, the, the truth is, of course, is that the big unspoken issue, which is not in the hands of the government, the Scottish government, the civil service, Brexiteers or leavers, is whether or not we find a vaccine sooner rather than later. All of our politics is frankly at the moment in the hands of the virologists. The optimistic of this government is that actually, as Matt Hancock was hinting in the House of Commons yesterday, that actually the Oxford vaccine, which seems to be one that is furthest down the testing, is actually demonstrated to at least at minimum to be efficacious in suppressing symptoms, if not necessarily transmission, and that that is true of older people, um, uh, and, uh, and that it is true at least for 12 months, even if it's not necessarily something that's going to provide lifetime immunity. And that therefore, as a result, by Christmas, we have started vaccinating the population. And that therefore, as a result, that sectors of society, which, you know, it's basically, it's large scale events, which are, you know, it's the section of our economy, which it's very, very difficult to, to get back and which, you know, is, there's just no immediate prospect that we're suddenly going to be, 
filling concert halls, conference venues, football stadia, etc. We might get, get a few people in, but we're not, and, and they are, and that's the whole area, which is, it's mass gatherings, which are out for the foreseeable future. Now, if that, if, if the vaccine kicks in such that, you know, mass gatherings become possible sooner rather than later, as a result, therefore, some of these industries are, are, are able to get back into business sooner rather than later. Then, uh, uh, you know, uh, and as a result, the economy re recovers. Well, you know, that's the favourable impression for Boris. Boris will be able to say, you know, we've defeated the virus, and it was done with good British bulldog money and great British scientists, and we're only, and we've got a world-beating vaccine. Yes. And for once, there might actually be to some truth to the argument. But sure, the downside is that actually the Oxford vaccine isn't very effective. The Imperial vaccine isn't very effective. The, the one or two of the American ones that are further on very, aren't very effective. The Russian one at least doesn't get out of Russia and perhaps we're all still wondering whether or not it's safe or not. And that in the meantime, you know, what, and it, you know we can see the rise in cases actually you know, the, even with the restrictions we've got, the amount of movement we've got at the moment is not something we're able to sustain. And we do have to go back to much more of a lockdown. And that therefore, as a result, you know, sure, people engaged in middle class uh, professional occupations that could be done over the internet, fine. As we've seen, they can carry on. Um, but that everything else that actually involves, you know, doing something uh, physical and certainly involves getting people together uh, gets more difficult. And that, then in, that, in those circumstances, there will be a risk that, sure, that, that unemployment will skyrocket. Um, people will say, why did the government waste so much money on furloughing if it, given it's, fa it's failed to keep it going? And I guess also an obvious potential risk is that people will blame Brexit because that's when the rise in unemployment will happen. Um, but, you know, which of these scenarios are going to play out we none of us know and it's not in that it's this is in the end not a political issue it's 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 to do with medicine and whether or not medicine manages to find a solution to a problem much more quickly than it's ever managed to find it before and none of us knows the answer to that question certainly uncertain times john um thank you very much for your time today we really appreciate it okay nice to talk to you and thank you for watching. You can find out more at www.brexit-watch.org. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time.